God. <laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And look, I can assure you, I'm no unicorn. Anyone can do what I'm doing. In fact, I think I'm looking at a lot of people here in the audience that can do exactly that and will be doing exactly that in a couple of months' time. So with that, let's kick off. Life science at scale. I want to tell you three stories. The first one is around the organization that I work for, CSRO in Australia. The second one is around the research that we do, the disease genes that we're finding and how we're doing this using Apache Spark. The third story is around once we identify the disease genes, can we correct them? And doing that with a serverless architecture. So with that, let's jump straight into the first one. So CSRO is Australia's government research agency, and we're in the top 1% of global research agencies. And CSRO are really passionate about translating research into products that people can use in their everyday life. Probably the one, one of the most famous products that we developed is modern Wi-Fi that is now used in billions of devices all over the world and is contributing to our healthy research budget of $1 billion annually. But we also developed a vaccine for the Hendra virus, which is a virus that is three times more deadly than Ebola. But on a lighter note, we also developed the Total Wellbeing Guide, which is a book filled with healthy, delicious recipes, and it's actually rivaling in the top selling list um, to Harry Potter and the Da Vinci Code. So therefore, I think it's a, a fairly nice balance between stuff that people use and stuff that people enjoy. So on that note, I'm working for the eHealth Research Center, which is quite a unique digital health agency in the world by covering the full spectrum from cell to for basic research to developing technology that can be used in the clinical practice today, all the way up to measuring the impact these technologies that we've developed had on improving people's lives. So therefore, the vision that we have at the center is to improve healthcare research through digital technology and services. So therefore, our Wi-Fi equivalent is the Cardi Hub, which is the first clinically accredited mobile app that helps people through the rehabilitation after they had a heart attack. And typically you would think that having a heart attack is a life-changing experience and after that you're rethinking your lifestyle choices. Well, it turns out it's not quite as good as an incentive as you would think. So therefore having this app, which makes it more convenient and gamifies the whole approach of going through rehabilitation, has increased the uptake by 30% and the completion rate by 70%, which is quite staggering. So this little app already has saved lives. So therefore, jumping straight into my research area, which is finding disease genes. So as you might know, the genome holds the blueprint for every cell in our body. It therefore affects the way that we look the disease risk that we have, and even our behavior. So usually I do this little this is an exercise where um, there's a particular gene that causes the last digit of your thumb to either be straight, what I have, or go all the way back. So I have a normal, boring thumb. What about you? Any, oh yeah, I can see some really impressive specimens in the audience. Similarly with coriander, so there's a gene that makes that alters the way that you perceive the taste of coriander. And there are usually one in six coriander haters in the audience. I think that's a little bit reduced here in, um, in India, but can I see any show of hands? Who hates coriander? Yeah, it's not your fault, it's your genome. So with all of that, oh sorry, of course, there is a you know, more sinister side to it in that the genome also holds your future disease risk. So for example, cystic fibrosis, there's one mutation in the three billion letters that we have, and it causes this devastate, devastating um, lung disease. So with this, it's no wonder that it's actually used more and more in the clinical practice. In fact, 
by 2025, 50% of the world's population will have been sequenced, at least as estimated by uh, Frost and Sullivan. But that means that genomics will produce more data than the typical big data disciplines. In fact, it's producing you know, more than YouTube, astronomy, Twitter combined. And that will amount to 20 exabytes of new data generated each year, which I think is quite exciting, actually. So, and the reason that I would know that, you know, analyzing that kind of data is actually quite challenging is because we are part of the Project MINE, which is an international consortium that looks at the origin of a motor neuron disease called ALS, that you might be familiar because Stephen Hawkins suffered from it, or from the Ice Bucket Challenge. So therefore, this consortium, with all that publicity, um, was one of the first ones, if not the only one, that has the power to generate large volumes of genomic data. In fact, they will generate 22,000 whole genome data sets in order to find out what is the origin, you know, what is the disease gene that causes ALS, and ultimately, what could be a treatment for it. So therefore, the process is that all these patients and healthy um, programs, controls, will spit in the tube or have the blood taken, and then from there, the genome will be unlocked. And then together, this large cohort of 22,000 individuals will help identify the cause and then ultimately the treatment. So how to actually find disease genes? Well, as I was saying, we need to accumulate a lot of data to compare um, individuals. So therefore, each line here represents an individual. We then identify the differences between this individual and a reference genome. So this is, on average, between you and the person sitting next to you, there are two million differences. Some of them are you know, uh, very good in that they define who you are. Others might be less good in that in some individual might lead to the diseases. So therefore, each box here represents a difference uh, between individuals. And then, as I said, cases, which are the ones that have ALS versus controls, that are the healthy individuals. And then we just spot the difference. In this case, it's this, um, these lines lined up. But reality is that Complex diseases are not as easy as that. In fact, it's that it's not one location typically uh, contributing to the disease, but it's a set of locations. So it might be some drivers in there and then some modulating factors, your genetic background. For example, in ALS, usually the time from diagnosis to death is three years, but some people manage to hang on longer. For example, Stephen Hawkins um, managed to delay the progression for 40 years. So there must be something in the genome that is protective. So identifying this will be part of um, our mission. So therefore, what I'm saying here is that we need to build models over this whole feature set of the three billion letters in the genome. And we not want to identify the single feature that contributed to it, but the set of feature that jointly contributes to it. And therefore, there needs to be some machine learning involved in that and particular for us, it was random forest. So, but doing a machine learning task on this amount of data is quite challenging. So just to put it back in our head, we have 22,000 individuals and we have 80 million features. So the two million differences on average when you have 22,000 individuals mounts up to 80 million features. So therefore, our matrix that we compute or we do the machine learning over is 22,000 times 80 million which is 1.7 trillion data points. And this is by no means an easy, an easy feat. And our, again, our task was to identify the features, so the columns that correspond to the truth label or disease status. So at this stage, because I know that you're not um, a biological audience, at this stage I would like to take the time for us to think about what other use cases there could be that will experience that kind of data. Maybe not today, but going forward. So for example, you might want to predict the churn rate or the occurrence of failure in an industrial plant 
or even fraud or attack um, detection. So instead of 80 million genomic variants, we might have a time series data or concatenator data from multiple events or sensor data, like the IoT community here will probably attest to that the amount of automatically collected data points is easily, you know, soon going to millions of features. Or it might be log files. So therefore, the task here then, rather than detecting disease genes, will be to find predictive markers. So for example, in a plant, you want to predict in two weeks' time, you know, the failure rate, and you want to identify which sensors in an industrial plant can forecast this catastrophic event. So therefore, what generally do we need to do in order to analyze this kind of wide data, be that genomic data or be that a data set that you might have to deal with going forward? And bear with me while I tell you how I think about sort of this ecosystem. We're all familiar with a desktop compute, which really is geared towards small data, the convenience of running your analysis then and there. But of course, it's limited to the amount of compute that you have available. Typically, you have one node, and there are a couple of CPUs on that node. Now, the next step up, in my mind, from that is high-performance compute, which is basically a set of these nodes stringed together and you compute things um, in parallel on there. So therefore, the use case here is that it's compute-intensive tasks, where each um, individual calculation can be done independently on the rest. And if you have to share information, then that gets a bit complicated, but you can do it by writing um, bespoke code, like Open MPI, for example. But the problem is that this note, this sharing of information between nodes is quite cumbersome and it's not automated. Therefore, it's not catering for data intensive tasks, what we have here. And the data intensive task applications, the ideal um, use case for that or the, the method for that in my mind is Hadoop Spark because the way I think about it is it dissolves the boundaries between those nodes by having this standardized way of transacting between nodes. So therefore, we can use all the CPUs on your Spark Hadoop cluster rather than being siloed into a different node, if that, if that makes sense. So therefore, when we developed our algorithm, we used Hadoop Spark for doing so. So therefore, the tool that we developed is called Variant Spark. As I said, it's a random forest approach, and we benchmarked it against the machine learning technologies that are out there that typically use, um, or are used for random forests. One is a Spark, we use a Spark as well, which is Spark ML. The other ones are R implementation, C++ implementation, and I think H2O is the C, C implementation. So therefore what I'm plotting here is the accuracy, so how well the tools did on the data set that we have against the speed. And as you can see there in Spark, in, in this particular example is exceeding both inaccuracy and speed of the um, other technologies. Speed, that is probably to be accepted because, oh, expected because you know, we designed Varian Spark exactly for that application case. But accuracy was actually quite interesting because underlying all of this is the same sort of algorithm, random forest. Therefore, you wouldn't expect it to be an actual difference in the accuracy. But the interesting thing here is that all the other technologies were not able to cater for the full data set. Therefore, we had to subset the data set and then basically on each of those subsets compare the technologies. And what I'm plotting here is the best subset that a tool was able to run successfully on. Therefore, Spark ML was only able to use 80% of the data set and the other tools um, or even further, so H2O, for example, I think was only 50% of the data set. And that clearly shows you that using the full data set in order to make your decision is a, good is, a, is a good approach rather than doing a feature selection beforehand and then going in. Because when you do that, the typical way of you know, doing feature selection first 
and then building your beautiful complex model on that, is that you subset the data on features that are individually predictive, but there might not be the set that is actually the most predictive. And this set might individually have not strong association with the truth label, but jointly will make the difference. Therefore, going in completely unbiased, picking from the whole data set, picking the ones that together predict, the, in our case, the disease, was the best approach to going forward. So this one is just to quickly show you how variant spark is scaling with the number of samples. So there's the traditional way of thinking about big data is you have more and more samples, which is basically this dimension. But also, it's scaling well, equally linear, with the number of rows that we're adding to the data set. Good. So with that, Variant Spark is already used, as I said, by Project Mine and by a couple of other universities in Australia, most noteworthy in Macquarie University. But it's also picked up by some commercial partners. Databricks, for example, um, partnered with us to generate a notebook, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. But again, let's take back a step and think about the cloud application or the typical workflow in a data science application. So you start with a business case. In our case, that was predicting disease genes. In your case, it might be something else. You then curate the data in order to you know, make it computable. And arguably, this is the most challenging bit of the whole thing, because we know data is noisy, it's missing. Uh, you have to consolidate it from different silos. So this in itself is already you know, black magic, some people would say. But there are certain tools that will help you do that and certain practices and skill sets that you can learn. So once we have a clean data set, we'll build the actual technology on to predict something, for example. So this I call the minimal viable product. And here we need to scope the technology, what kind of um, language we want to use, Python, C, R, whatnot, and develop the prototype and then we iterate because the first the first thing that we uh, put together is probably not going to be uh, the best approach. Once we have that um, minimal viable product, in order for it to be used for the business case, you probably have to put it to a stage that is actually production ready. And for that, you need to provide an endpoint and you need to test at scale. So on premise, this Going through this is quite easy, other than the challenges that we discussed, but technologically, it's quite easy. The only problem with on-premise is that it's quite expensive. You have to maintain, you have to put money into maintaining it rather than computing it. And it's potentially not scalable. Therefore, having a cloud-based solution might be, in the majority of cases, the preferred way to do it. But it's quite challenging at this stage still to put something on the cloud that covers this full spectrum from doing experimental work, you know, in order to get the minimal viable product, tear down solutions, come up with new ones, and then go to the next stage of having a stable endpoint that is easy to maintain. Databricks, for example, is able, in my mind, to cover the first two boxes of curating the data, you know, cleaning it, and building the minimal viable product. It's probably not a good idea for the endpoint, but, you know, being grateful here, let's start with Databricks in the first instance and see how we go. So specifically, Variance Bug is set up on Databricks. And if you're not familiar with Databricks, basically what it is, it's you can spin up a Spark Hadoop cluster from a Databricks notebook and you can put in the code as you would with a, Julia not, uh, a Julius notebook. So how many of you are familiar with notebooks? Oh yeah, good, good, good. So this is exactly the same thing where you can have your code blocks, annotation blocks, and put in um, some graphics in there. The other nice thing about Databricks is that it has Amazon and Microsoft Azure as the endpoint. So depending on which account you have, you can use either or, or both. So obviously, we wanted to put something out there that people can use and can play with. But putting genomic data in the cloud is not a good idea. 
therefore, we came up with this synthetic data set, and we wanted to make it a bit of fun. So therefore, it's the hipster index, and we score people whether they're hipster or not, which is a truth label, and then from there, we predict the genes that make you a hipster or a non-hipster. And looking at the audience, there are some traits of a hipster, textured, beautiful hair, coffee consumption. So if you're interested in this and play around with this really fun data set, I encourage you to go to our Databricks notebook and download it. In fact, this is what we're going to do on Sunday in the workshop. With Databricks being you know, nice and easy for building the minimal viable product, but not so nice and easy to providing the endpoints, we were thinking of, can we do this whole thing without Databricks? Can we set up something uh, directly on AWS? And let's walk through the steps that are actually involved in order to do that. So we first need to put variance bark in a Docker container. From that, we then need to have something to provision this elastic Kubernetes service on AWS, so to have all those master nodes. And then from that, we need to spawn the worker nodes in that, in that cluster. And this beautiful infrastructure, we need to connect from the outside in order to monitor it, which is the connecting to the Elastic Kubernetes service for monitoring. And then also in order to have this nice data science approach to it, we want to connect a Jupyter notebook instance to all of this in order to trigger runs and collect the information back. Sounds relatively trivial, at least that's what I thought. Therefore, I asked Lynn to look into that. Lynn Langett, so you might know her, she's a very famous cloud evangelist, and she's really at the cutting edge, so I thought this might tickle her fancy, and thankfully it did. So she came up with this beast of an infrastructure, which st stands up exactly this complicated workflow that we just discussed for variant Spark. Now, I don't expect anyone to have the skill set that Lynn has to, to be able to create that. So therefore, we went one step further and put all of that in a convenient infrastructure as a code template. So how many are, of you are in, uh, familiar with um, IATSE, infrastructure as a code? Okay, let's. So let me quickly explain the way that I think about it, is that you have these beautiful architectures in the cloud that you might have put there manually or through um, the command line interface. In order to replicate that, maybe in a different availability zone, or for it to share with your, with your friends, you don't want to go through this painful process of setting it up the second time when you already know what you want. Therefore, this infrastructure as code provides a template, a text file, a flat file that is JSON or JAML, and it basically describes everything in your data structure. So the permissions, the services, the connections between it, the, um, the S3 buckets, and all of this is described in one flat file. Therefore, this flat file is given to an interpreter, which in this case, it's a CloudFormation um, template from AWS, and then this cloud formation spins up the whole infrastructure from the flat file. So therefore, what Lynn managed to do is put it into that flat file so I can share now that flat file with each one of you, and you just press a button, put it in cloud formation, and you can stand up your complex piece of a Kubernetes service, machine learning with variant spark, connecting to your S3 bucket, and having the whole complicated analysis done for you. So if this tickles your fancy and if you think, hmm, I would like to help in you know, finding disease genes or writing these cool infrastructures yourself, and you think, can I help? And the clear answer is yes. Just like Lynn did, there are lots of little things that um, people can contribute in order to build this ecosystem together. So in fact, if, you, if this slightly interests you, get in contact with me right now and say, yes, I would like to be a volunteer. Good, so with this, let's jump into the last story, which is around, can we correct the disease genes that we identified? And you might have heard of a technology that is called CRISPR, which in my mind 
revolutionize the way that medicine will be done going forward. Because it enables you to edit the genome of a living cell in order to remove a disease gene, for example. In fact, there was a paper last year that managed to do exactly that in embryos that suffered or that would have suffered from a heart disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which makes the heart muscle increase and then eventually the heart stops working. So they managed to do that in, as I mentioned, correct that disease in seven out of 10 embryos, which is great, but that also means that in three out of 10, it did not work. And if this is your own unborn child, then three out of 10 failure rate is just not good enough. Therefore, we want to come in and make this process more efficient so that it works ideally the first time, every time. So with us, we um, generated or we developed the search engine for the genome, or at least what we think of as a search engine for the genome, where researchers can type in the gene that they want to edit and how they want to edit it, and the tool ranks all the possible ways of doing that so that researchers know straight away which is their best option and their best choice in order to put their precious resources, for example, an embryo, not a danger. So therefore, there is a user, inter a user interface here where you have each line represents a location where the genome can be edited. And in green, I'm representing the sites that are good. In black, the ones that are not so good. And as you can see, they're quite close to each other and it's hard to differentiate them unless you have a compute done over it. So why is this difficult? Well, the way I think about it, it's like finding a grain of sand on a beach. It needs to have the right properties or the right color, the right size, and the right shape for the editing mechanism to interact with it. But once you have you know, all your candidates on the sand, a bucket of sand, you then need to ensure that this sand cone is actually, or this sand grain is actually unique on the beach because the equivalent in the genome will be that you want to make sure that it's editing this particular gene and not another healthy gene. Therefore, what you need to do is you need to make sure that the grain of sand, and you need to compare this grain of sand with all the other grains of sand on the beach. And this makes it a you know, quite complicated and compute intensive task. So therefore, it doesn't fall into the typical categories that we just discussed. Like, it's not compute intensive all the time, but it's certainly not data intensive. So therefore, those previous two solutions are not quite what we're after. But thankfully, there's this new technology that just came out, um, which is called serverless. So serverless really is geared towards being agile. You recruit, so the way that I think about it is that you recruit CPUs, free floating CPUs, and you recruit as much or as many as you need when you need it instantaneously. And this, for us, the search engine for the genome, which is a web application, is exactly what we needed. Because people might want to search you know, one gene, or they want to search the hundred thousands of genes or locations in the genome that they are. Therefore, the task can be quite small, or it can be enormous, and you don't want to have an enormous spark buster running all the time. Therefore, serverless compute was the exact thing that we actually needed. So this is the architecture. I'm not going to go into detail. Suffice to say that there is a web service where the user can interact. And this web service is connected to an API gateway. And from there, all the tasks are, are triggered through um, using different services from AWS. As such, it was one of the first applications, serverless application that went beyond Alexa skills to really demonstrate that you can stand up this complicated infrastructure that can cater for something as sophisticated as research, handle that. So therefore, we received a lot of attention. Now, it is actually also available on Alibaba. And thanks to Sabbath and um, Jason, who managed to, to do that from um, the serverless team that they have there. So as you can see, it's looking strikingly similar. And there are similar components in both things. And this was something that was really important to me in being cloud agnostic. 
having a technology that is running on AWS as well as it might be running on Alibaba. So yeah, for just a quick comparison between Alibaba and AWS that I, might, that I thought you might be interested in. The database that we're using in order to collect our buckets, buckets of sand, our buckets of um, potential target site is stored in a um, SQL-like serverless database. Alibaba is called Table Store, AWS is called DynamoDB. And the difference is here is that Table Store is able to store slightly larger volumes in each cell, which for genomic research is actually a plus. Similarly, the actual functional compute, one is called function compute, the other one is called the lambda function. And the difference with here is that Alibaba managed to have functions call other functions, which is great for spawning our tasks and collecting the results, so doing parallel serverless processing. But AWS has a workaround that we use um, through the SNS servers, which for us um, gave a similar result. The other thing is uh, log servers versus CloudWatch. In my mind, they are the same, the same thing. And the cloud formation template, the infrastructure as a code thing, Alibaba has a similar tool called Bun. It's, uh, it doesn't even have a logo, so it's not very um, advanced yet. It does, it does what it needs to do. So uh, GT Scan is available as a fun thing. Um, but CloudFormation is for sure more mature than, um, than fun. So with this, in my mind really, once you go serverless, you never go back. Because it's so easy, it's so convenient. It's so cheap, it's so economical. Therefore, innovation is not slowed down by having to think about what kind of EC2 instance do I need to have? Can I afford it going forward? And things like that. You just write your function and let you know, the infrastructure do, or Alibaba or AWS or Azure do the rest for you. It allows or it caters for bursts of all workloads. While you can do auto scaling in a traditional way, it is quite slow, so it's not as instantaneous as serverless. So for burstable workloads, serverless is the way to go. And innovation becomes easily affordable. As I said, you can, you can stand up a minimal viable product quite cheaply on um, using serverless architecture. And in fact, you then are able, because everything is modularized, you can exchange individual components. I'm going to show you how easy that is in a minute. Actually, I'm showing it to you right now. So with all of this you know, ease of use, what is difficult about it, because it's distributed infrastructure, is actually optimizing the infrastructure or finding the bottlenecks. So in our case, for example, we know that there was one component of GT Scan that was actually quite slow. But before we go into that, let's let me introduce you to something that we call hypothesis-driven architecture. And if you've been to one of the YAO conferences or seen James Lewis talk about it, it's sort of in the way that, that he's talking about it. Where you have, you start from your infrastructure as a code, from your JSON or YAML file that defines a, a specific architecture. You then evolve it, making small changes to it, like replacing a particular function, for example, with another function. You then deploy this new architecture, this updated architecture, on your pro, uh, provider of choice, and you evaluate the runtime of each component, ideally with a, a method that automatically detects the infrastructure that you just uploaded. And before we were doing it with X-Ray, which is an AWS service on AWS, it worked fairly nicely, but now we're using Epsigon which is a startup from Israel that is specializing on detecting the infrastructure and evaluating each component in that infrastructure and really having a nice visual interface for doing, for doing that. So once you collected your measurements, you can evaluate whether that small change that you made is actually a good idea. And then the cycle iterates. So through this, you can do DevOps, in my mind, more securely and more easily. And therefore, we published a 
quite controversial blog article on DevOps.com that we titled DevOps 2.0. So this is a new way of uh, which we think that DevOps should be done, that you have your environment, your, your production environment running, you at the same, in the same availability zone, in the same location, you deploy your new experimental infrastructure, you evaluate both against each other, and then you swap over to the new one, and the cycle iterates. So with that, again, we will be doing that on the Sunday, in the Sunday workshop. So standing up an infrastructure and evaluating it. So coming back to the use case that we had, where we wanted to improve GT scan and find the bottlenecks in there. So therefore, we recorded, we recorded the runtime of all functions that we have in the system, and this is what I'm showing in the, um, in the different bar pods. And, and as you can see, there are two offenders that stand out and really suck up all the runtime. So they are, in, in that architecture that I have, there are these two lambda functions in the middle, so the orange, the orange boxes in the middle, that bring in information from a um, DB, DynamoDB database, c compute over it, and spit out the result in another DynamoDB database. So those codes were academic tools that we were just using in a Lambda function. But being a machine learning um, team ourselves, we thought, well, maybe we can do it slightly better using machine learning. And this is exactly what we did. So we replaced those two functions with a new function that did you know, the same analysis, but with machine learning this time. So it was, again, a random forest approach. We're not going, we don't need to go into detail, but what I want to show you is that the runtime reduced dramatically, and we were able to evaluate that and quantify it, the improvement that we made to our architecture. So therefore, the business case that we had is that by replacing this, these two lambda functions with the one lambda function that we had, we were able to reduce the runtime by 80%, and that's probably a use case or a, you know, a business case that anyone can get behind it. Let's quickly walk through the rest, though. So with recapping the, um, the use cases that we had, so again, remember, it was the business case. From that, we need to curate and collect the data that we need in order to act on the business case. We want to build a minimal viable product, and then we want to prepare for our production. So for variance bug, the use case is finding a disease stain. The curated data is genomic data, and we had to pre-process it um, using Python, R, and SQL. The minimal viable product, it's still a variance bug. I mean, yes, it's mature, but it's still, <laughs> it's still not a production-ready environment there. So therefore, yeah, the minimal viable product, variance bug, build on Apache using Elastic MapReduce or um, Databricks, or now Lin's new Elastic Kubernetes services. Therefore, preparing for production is to make these elastic Kubernetes service to offer them as a infrastructure, as a code, so people can just press a button and it spins up automatically, and testing at scale. So we will, test, we will be testing it on Project Mine data, which is 25,000 individuals. The other thing that I, that I showed you was GT scan. So here, the business problem was that we wanted to build a search engine for the genome. The genomic data, or well, the data again is genomic data, it's located on an S3 bucket, and we want to access it uh, through NoSQL. And the minimal viable product is GT scan, uh, serverless, it's a serverless ecosystem in AWS, but it's also now available on Alibaba. Therefore, the research community can access it through an API gateway. And testing will be done in a research facility in Australia that has 10,000 mice each day coming through, getting edited and out the door. So therefore, where to from here? Really, what we want to do is we want to find disease genes for a range of different diseases that are out there, ideally for you know, things that really affect the healthcare system, like stroke and heart attack. From that, we want to be able to potentially correct, or at least, you know, replicate the information in the clinical, in the laboratory setting in order to identify 
new, new ways of doing, of finding um, drug treatments. And this is where GT scan comes in. But then all of this, you know, is still firmly in the research space. We want to go into the clinical practice and really have impact there. And this is a tool that I haven't showed you yet, but it's called GenFen Insights, so genome, phenome, which is the medical data insight. And remember, I said once you go serverless, you never go back. This one is a serverless technology. So next time when you invite me, I can showcase that to you. So three things to remember. The datafication of everything will make all data sets grow wider. There's no doubt in my mind that in IoT, where it's automatically um, it's, um, collected information about a, an event, the amount of rows that we're dealing with will grow into millions, if not billions. So therefore, while genomic might have to deal with it today, you will have to deal with it probably going tomorrow and going forward. So therefore, in my mind, this really represents a paradigm shift in machine learning, and we need to come up with new ways of dealing with this imbalance between samples and features. And GT, uh, sorry, variance bug is one option of, um, of dealing with that, or one solution capable of dealing with that. Serverless architecture can really deal with application cases that are not just Alexa skills or individual components, but they are able to provide this huge ecosystem that can cater for something as complicated as a research application. So therefore, I would highly encourage you to investigate this area. And in fact, Forbes was saying that 50% of the companies that they interviewed actually seriously thinking about moving to serverless infrastructure. So this, this is coming and it's predicted to be a $7 billion market um, going forward. So if you want to jump in now, or if you want to jump in, now is probably the time for it. But the main take home message I think from my talk is that business and life sciences are not that different, right? The tools that we developed with one can be used for other areas as well. So therefore, let's build a healthier future together. With that, thank you very much. Perfect timing. Two minutes for questions. Fantastic. All right, we have a hand there. Hi, thank you for the session. It was very nice. So, uh, just a curious question about the two lambda functions, okay? Uh, where, when you reduced it to one, uh, the time was less. So, was it the case that the lambda functions had some interactions and they were doing something redundant? Otherwise, it looks pretty odd that two lambda functions, when made one, performance, there was a drastic difference. So. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so don't get hung up that it's two functions doing one. They were not doing redundant things. They were just doing things horribly inefficient. Like, I'm not, not meaning to trash the uh, academic community. Their task is to come up with new um, ideas and bring that and demonstrate it. But they're not known for implementing stuff properly. So therefore, the statistical analysis that they were doing in their functions could be easily replaced with um, a machine learning that we trained offline and then had just to do with the classification on the fly, which of course reduces the time drastically. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that serverless is the future or it's the present. How did you guys solve the monitoring in production actually? The monitoring? Monitoring of your applications in production? Yes. Because serverless makes it really difficult to yes. monitor it compared yes. to the server architecture. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, we, we face that problem actually in yes. production. And I can wholeheartedly <laughs> feel your pain. Sure. Yes. And none of the cloud providers have a good solution for that. So the one that I'm intimately familiar with is um, X-Ray, right, on AWS, which lets you to some extent I, I label the function and then you can, run, you can monitor them, whether they are down, whether they um, you know, uh, uh, time out, and uh, what kind of resources they ingest. But it's, it's painful. Therefore, this is what 
not to um, you know, be too marketing here, and I have no stake in Epsilon whatsoever, but Epsilon was the solution, really the savior for us, in that they take care of all of this, and that they, um, he just pointed to a new architecture in the cloud. It automatically surveys the connections between the individual components and then monitors them in a dashboard. For us, the runtime was the main thing that we were after, the end-to-end -end runtime and where, to, where most of the time will be um, drained in or what kind of processes will be running over and over again and we need to focus our optimization efforts. All of this, Epsilon gave us. All right, thank you, Dr. Dennis. This was very helpful. I hope people uh, were asking for more tech stuff, and this probably gives a glimpse of some of the tech stuff that's going on in the data science community. So thank you so much.